And greetings. Happy Thursday. Welcome to the Steve Day Show. We are hunkered down here amid billowing clouds of coronavirus infected air. Nonetheless, we persisted. 888-900-3393 is the number. 888-900-3393. Steve at stevedace.com is how you can email us. You can like us on Facebook. Follow us on Twitter at Steve Dace Show. And if you're looking for clips of this show to sample or share, uh, feel free to go to youtube.com slash Steve Dace. And the last name is D-E-A-C-E. Coming up a little bit later on today, uh, Sean Davis from The Federalist will join us at the bottom of the hour. We'll have some Theology Thursday. Also, uh, three non-political questions. You already saw uh, Todd's disapproving glance. Uh, Aaron is here with us as well. In fact, let's throw it to him right now for what happened while we were away. What happened while we were away? Brought to you by Europe. President Trump gave an address from the Oval Office last night regarding coronavirus. To keep new cases from entering our shores, we will be suspending all travel from Europe to the United States for the next 30 days. The new rules will go into effect Friday at midnight. Taking early, intense action, we have seen dramatically fewer cases of the virus in the United States than are now present in Europe. The European Union failed to take the same precautions and restrict travel from China and other hotspots. As a result, a large number of new clusters in the United States were seeded by travelers from Europe. To ensure that working Americans impacted by the virus can stay home without fear of financial hardship, I will soon be taking emergency action, which is unprecedented, to provide financial relief. This will be targeted for workers who are ill, quarantined, or caring for others due to coronavirus. After that address, the White House had to clarify that trade of goods between the U.S. and Europe would not be halted. The panic over the Wuhan coronavirus has continued. According to the CDC, 938 cases have now been confirmed in the United States, with 29 total deaths. Also, according to the CDC, on Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday of this week, four cases total were confirmed, compared with 34 combined over last weekend alone. The CDC also said says that illnesses during that rough time frame may not have yet been reported. Yesterday, the NCAA announced that its men's and women's basketball tournaments, which take place in several cities across the country, will be played without fans being allowed to attend. This also applies to all spring athletic championship events, including the NCAA wrestling tournament, also set to begin imminently in Minneapolis. After this announcement was made, multiple conferences, including the Big Ten and Big 12, became the latest conferences to announce that their conference basketball tournaments would be played without fans. Yesterday evening, the NBA announced that it's suspending its season until further notice after a player for the Utah Jazz tested positive for the virus. Actor Tom Hanks announced yesterday that he tested positive for coronavirus while he was in Australia. Italy has ordered all shops closed with the exception of pharmacies due to the outbreak. Numerous reports from that country as well say that doctors there are being forced to decide which patients to treat and which patients to let die due to shortages. Some of what seems to be driving the panic in the last 24 hours is the congressional testimony of Dr. Anthony Fauci, one of the top immunologists in the U.S. government. The seasonal flu that we deal with every year has a mortality of 0.1 percent. The stated mortality overall of this, when you look at all the data, including China, is about 3%. It first started off as two and now three. I think if you count all the cases of minimally symptomatic or asymptomatic infection, that probably brings the mortality rate down to somewhere around 1%, which means it is 10 times more lethal than the seasonal flu. Global stocks took yet another tumble after President Trump's announcement of a European travel ban. The Dow Jones dropped 1,400 points yesterday and is now down 20% from last month's record close. Learning Spanish today, today's phrase is, if there's no toilet paper available at Walmart, try a subscription to the New York Times. Si no hay papel higiénico disponible en Walmart, pruebe una suscripción al New York Times. 
Headline from Slate, should I pause my open marriage because of the coronavirus? Headline from The Guardian, hands off, should orgies keep going in the age of coronavirus? Headline from The Huffington Post, as COVID-19 spreads in Seattle, sex workers are losing clients and taking more risks. In other news, the genesis of the Me Too movement, former Hollywood producer Harvey Weinstein was sentenced yesterday to 23 years in prison for rape and sexual assault. Weinstein was hospitalized with chest pains after receiving the sentence. You may remember this clip from last week. Somebody tweeted recently that um, actually with the money he spent, he could have given every American a million dollars. I've got it. Let's put it up yeah. on the screen. It, when I read it uh, tonight on social media, it kind of all became clear. Bloomberg spent $500 million on ads, U.S. population $327 million. Uh, don't tell us if you're ahead of us on the math. He could have given each American $1 million dollars and have had lunch money left over. The propagator of that math error, Mara Gray of the New York Times editorial board, responded to critics and blamed racism for why people made fun of her. And finally, checking in on Sarah Palin. The masked singer Sarah Palin, and that's what happened while we were away. One quick note on those numbers from the CDC. I just saw a story that popped up saying that the CDC themselves have only tested 77 uh, people from Monday to Wednesday, I believe, of this week, which is an ex- obviously an exceedingly low number. Those numbers from the CDC, as I understand it, are indicative of what states are reporting across the country as well. All right. So here's what I want to do with this today. Um at, uh, at 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 the urging of several of you uh, via request uh, via email uh, and social media to this program, uh, a good friend of mine, and then you know just me being a husband and a dad. What I did last night uh, is I listened to the president's address on this, and and then I turned, um, I, I I watched Glenn Beck's special here on the channel. After that, um, I watched it with Amy and our son, Noah. And then um, after everybody went to bed, I spent the next several hours doing some of my own research aside from political media. I I didn't go to any forums that share, um, dispense, collect, uh, aggregate political opinion with alongside news. I, I just did this independent of all of that. Um, for example, last night, this, uh, piece over at medium, which is kind of a catch all website, uh, where you can post uh, independent thought this piece over at medium was went viral. I, I had friends of mine sharing it with me. I saw people sharing it on social media, uh, essentially, you know, this guy's 3000 word opus. And I read every word, uh, was hide your kids, hide your wives. Cause they're coronavirus and everybody up in the air. That, that, that was essentially his, I mean, he went full bed intruder and, you, and when you read the piece, his biography is not in the piece. It's not at the top, nor is it at the bottom. There's no bio for him. So I had to do a very um, advanced research technique called Googling. And I typed his name into Google. And one of the first things that came up was his author page in Amazon.com. And it turns out he's got a degree in behavioral science. He's a script writer. And I think his last book was about the storytelling of Star Wars. He has, he has done no work in this field, none whatsoever, none. Doesn't mean he's wrong at everything, by the way, but it just goes to show how many people shared that and went bleep without checking any of that gentleman's qualifications. This is, this is how panics occur, all right? So, so here's what I did last night. I, I set aside for a few hours, I did listen Several of you sent me the link to one of the leading epidemiologists in the country from the University of Minnesota, who has served the last five U.S. presidents, including this one. And he was on the Joe Rogan podcast. I listened to that entire thing. I mean, I spent a good three, four hours on this last night. Got to bed late. Just looking at this independent of any political filter as best as I possibly could. 
because I'm a father, I'm a husband. I also own a business. I've got employees here. I cover their health insurance. Uh, they rely on my health uh, for them to have things like health insurance, right? All right. So what I'm about to share with you is a collection of the information that I, I discovered last night. And this is going to be commentary free. And then it will pivot towards the end where I will add my own commentary, but I will let you know when that occurs. All right. So what I'm about to share with you, this is commentary free. This is information I'm sharing with my own family. And I love all of you, but not as much as them. So if this is what I'm telling them, it's really, really what I was able to verify and believe to have enough truth that I should share this with my loved ones. Okay, let's begin. Coronavirus is not the flu. It is more than that. It, it's also not the stand. Uh, this is not an apocalyptic event, nor will it be unless the virus mutates into something unforeseen. However, that is a danger with any viral outbreak in all of human history that can happen. Number two, it is quite likely most of you watching or listening right now will get coronavirus at some point in your life for the same reason most of us will get the flu, a cold, etc. The main concern here is not the virus itself, but the instant strain it could put on our healthcare system. That is what occurred in Italy. And while our healthcare system is superior to theirs, this is not commentary. They essentially have the Bernie Sanders healthcare system in Italy. That's what they have. That is not commentary. It is a fact. So while our healthcare system is superior to theirs, any system, any human system can only handle so much strain. The worst projections, and I mean the absolute worst that I could find from a credible source, are as many as 460,000 Americans could die from this outbreak if it's not properly contained. To put that number in perspective, that is 200,000 fewer, more than 200,000 fewer Americans that die of cancer each year. However, the concern is that this could happen over the next few weeks and months all at once, like a cancer blizzard, instead of over the course of a year, sort of like getting an entire winter's snowfall in one storm. Uh, what would that do to your community's snow removal infrastructure? That is the concern. Especially because so much of our medical equipment, medicines, and other infrastructure has been outsourced for cheap labor and production to places like China. In fact, some of, our, uh, some of the Pentagon's medical relief that it relies upon comes from China for our soldiers. Uh, from Puerto Rico, which of course you'll recall had a massive a cataclysmic hurricane there uh, about a year ago. Um, that means we are behind on restocking necessary items. That is the main concern. That people will die because we aren't equipped for the overflow that may occur. Actual mortality rates, and you saw that in the testimony on Capitol Hill just a moment ago in Aaron's montage. Actual mortality rates are tough to nail down. Because the virus isn't so much an independent killer. Again, this isn't Captain Trips. The virus isn't so much an independent killer as much as it can kill those with already vulnerable health. That's why the elderly are at such high risk. For example, China has an extraordinarily high smoking population, and this is a respiratory virus. So that's one of the factors over there. Italy has uh, less of a smoking population than China, but still larger than ours. And then we have an obesity problem, particularly for people over the age of 55. So it depends on the general health of your family and community. So when you're seeing stories, for example, that say uh, 1%, 3%, like that's a blanket number across the board. It is not. That's very important to understand. There have been some locales where because of the general health of the populace, the number is in decimal points. And then there have been some locales because of the general health of the population, the number has been six or 7%. So that's just, they're just leveling off the average. 
it's not that simple. It, it, it you know, we all don't have the same health. Certain uh, areas have higher obesity, higher elderly, more smoking, etc. All right, so it's not that simple. Therefore, your best defense is to take your own health seriously, as you should always do anyway. Uh, the healthier you are, the less vulnerable you are the less you may need to access the healthcare system if indeed it ends up becoming strained. Because if they're overrun with, overrun with coronavirus, that obviously takes time away from other ailments and maladies. That is why emphasis on things like hand sanitizer. Uh, you're seeing that. Disinfectant wipes. Now, it's unknown if these disinfectants actually kill this virus. But the, the more you can assure that you are healthy, the less you need to be concerned, the less likely you will, you'll be a transmitter, even if you're healthy. Same with wiping down doorknobs, countertops, etc. A vaccine could be ready for trial at any moment. That's not the issue, how soon they can produce one. The issue is it could take months to years to test that vaccine to make sure it is safe for mass consumption. Because you run into the law of unintended consequences here. What are the side effects of the vaccine? There haven't been mass school closings because about a third of the nation's nurses have children in schools. And the concern is closing them now, blanket closing them now, may cause a further shortage of healthcare workers who need to stay home with their kids. You may say in response to that, well, hey, we have summer vacations every year in their home. You're right, we do. And you, you would assume families make accommodations for that on a perennial basis. We're not in the months of June, July, and August right now, though. We're in the months of March, April, and May when they don't have those accommodations at the ready. Speaking of healthcare workers, they're going to get the latest information first because health is a priority. Their health is a priority so that they can help other people. Therefore, keep up to date on what life choices you see healthcare workers, you know. That, you, you, that your family's with, friends with, uh, neighbors with. Keep, keep up today on, on the choices that they're making. Social distancing is being urged, not because people will die for attending a college basketball game. There's liability concerns that are driving that, okay? But in the hopes of slowing down any potential outbreaks so that we don't overrun our clinics and hospitals all at once. If you're healthy, you have very little to worry about. But if you're obese elderly, or otherwise unhealthy, stay home much more often and stay away, as the president urged last night. And now what follows is my commentary on this matter. The virus is very real. And we've told you this all week. The precautions being urged about your health are also pretty much what we've been urging on this show all week. Do not let your disdain for left American media cause you to just disregard this as fake news and put yourself at risk. Don't, don't do that. Don't fall for the false choice. Don't be a sheeple. We're going to talk about that here in a moment. Okay. Don't be a sheeple, but don't be a fool either. Okay. That being said, the panic left American media are stoking here over this uh, is very much fake news. Turn off all your cable news, even Fox because they're going to be triggered by what's said on the channels that hate the president and then trigger you. Because this is all now going to be. And the president tried to call for unity last night. That lasted for 10 seconds. And then it just became um, uh, your typical Hannity grope session and every other channel was dreadful. Okay? So uh, this is all going to be Trump. It's not the Trump virus. All right? And Donald Trump, you know, your loved ones hopefully are going to be here long after Donald Trump is gone from the White House. All right. Or, or reelected as whatever the case may be. This is about you and your loved ones. Live your life. Turn this noise off. Extend the precautions you make with your families during a typical flu season for another few weeks or months. Practice good hygiene, both personally, but domestically. Right. You know, um, get active. Eat healthier. You, you could see health clubs close. Who knows? The good news is the weather is getting warmer around the country. Go outside. You can work out out there. You push ups in the driveway. I know I've done that many times, right? Um, load up on vitamin C. 
Make sure you're not vitamin D deficient. Those are the two vitamins that do the best to boost your immune system. It's about prudence, not panic. It is about prudence, not panic. It's about prudence, not panic. And one more time, it is about prudence and not panic. Finally, this confirms our globalization and outsourcing have gone way too far. People may actually die from this who should not, simply because we have handed over our national sovereignty for cheap labor and cheap goods. When this is over, there needs to be a national conversation about this once and for all, an adult conversation about handing over voluntarily way too much of our national sovereignty that has left us vulnerable to a situation like this. That is the end of the information I gathered and then my own commentary. Todd and Aaron, you may now share your thoughts if you have some. Aaron? Yeah, so um, my wife, Bella, she's a nurse and I'm biased, but she's not the run of the mill nurse. I mean, uh, she entertains herself sometimes by reading research journals and staying on top of this because she's ambitious and she's very proficient at what she does. And we've been talking about coronavirus um, probably weeks before we I even brought this up on the show during the montage. That was the first time it was ever mentioned on this show. And what she said then uh, and I've I've gone to her because I trust her as a source. And you said in in your points, Steve, to look at the look at the changes, the lifestyles of of family members, of friends who are in the healthcare industry. And her her position and posture on this really hasn't changed since we first heard about it back in January. I think for the first time. And and now, the bottom line is, if you are in good health, if you are a, a relatively young person, or just generally in good health. Most of the time, you are going to either A, be asymptomatic, not know, even know you have it, B, have the symptoms of a, a bad cold or a mild flu, and C, if it's worse than that, that doesn't, uh, you know, that, that doesn't guarantee that you're going to die from this. Uh, and then D, if you are having pre-existing conditions, COPD, if you have an immune uh, system uh, deficiency, uh, if you have underlying conditions, you are at great risk, just like you are with even a common cold or the seasonal flu. That's not downplaying this virus. That's, that's just, that's the reality, folks. What's also the reality is that this is obviously spreading very quickly, just as, and I said this, I think I was the first person to say this on this show, what you said during your points, Steve, which is, Yes, this can this, you know, if it shuts down an entire country all at once. And I made this comment weeks ago about China. It would be like if if any workplace had all of their patients or all of their workers, I should say, out at once. That's a strain. That's a bad thing uh, that doesn't automatically mean the world is coming to an end. As far as as far as the actual panic about this goes. And I, I know as soon as I say this. Um, so that's the medical side of it. If you're in good health and taking care of yourself, you, you'll probably get it just like you've gotten. All of us have probably gotten coronavirus before, not the Wuhan coronavirus, probably, but all of us have gotten some stem probably of, of, of a coronavirus. So health concerns aside, do what you do. Be a responsible adult. And I saw somebody on the NFL Network of all places today saying that if you just say that this is like the, the flu or you just say wash your hands and, and use sanitizer, you're being a Corona tough guy. OK, if I'm not as panicked as you, that means I'm a t Corona tough guy. OK, and that's that. And why did he drive that. into the, stu the studio yes. of the NFL Network today? Yeah. Why didn't you stay home? So that brings me to the next part of this, the panic over this. And I'm going to be completely honest with you for the first time. And as soon as I say this, there's going to be some of you who say, well, you just want you just you, all you care about is your sports. No, the first time I started to take seriously or at least I wouldn't say I wouldn't say worried about it, but it's on my radar now. Uh, the panic surrounding this is when the NCAA announced yesterday that they were not going to allow people to attend the March Madness games because that's affecting millions of dollars of probably dozens, uh, not dozens, but uh, you know, various communities around uh, the United States that host these games. That's affecting their bottom line. And when the bottom line is affected and a culture as secular as ours, that's when you know something's really serious. And so it's not so much the virus itself, but the panic 
that's on my radar because the panic for most of us is what could pose the biggest threat of actually of actually affecting our day-to-day lives as well. So this is not downplaying it. It's not downplaying it. It's just being realistic that yes, as far as if, if you're if you're a person who has um, average to good health, you uh, long term as far as your health goes, you don't have a whole lot to be worried about. People with underlying conditions, very young and the very old, especially the very old, have more to be worried about. The, this is spreading quickly. All right, so that could put, cause a strain. These are not new. These are not new things that I've I, I've been postulating either. So I would say again, the panic is probably the, our biggest threat right now because in a culture that is so that is so uh, becoming more secularized and more dependent on uh, I got to take care of myself again. That's going to be our biggest threat is just the panic to the virus. How did Loki put it in Avengers? Um, you deserve to be ruled. You were made. You were made to, to be, be ruled. ruled. Is maybe. what he said. Yeah. Maybe. Listen, I'm uh, I'm not your average bear on this. Uh, I've done a fair amount of study. Now you can disagree again with what my conclusions are, but I, uh, about epidemiology and things like that. Steve, your snowfall analogy is apropos. There is something undeniable about this thing, the way it, it, it exists in the air a little longer, it exists on surfaces a little longer, mm-hmm. and therefore is just spreading faster because the normal lay of the land with the flu does not apply. So basically, you are just getting this density that makes it look like the, the sky is falling. But what you are really get, and 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 so instantly now everybody's like declaring, look, you you get that huge snow you've never seen, a global warming. Well, well, no, it's kind of like the, it's the anomaly. It's just coming, it's rushing in really fast. That that does that does not mean because you get volume within a certain number of time that this is any worse. No one, I, I, I put this on Twitter today. I'm utterly confident that if you are your average healthy American and you get the coronavirus, you are no more likely, based on everything we know, to have a, a very adverse illness, something out of the norm, or die than you are with the flu. That, that's just true. And the, the guy, uh, what, for, for, what's his the name? The key is what you said there. Repeat that first part of the sentence so that it doesn't take if it out of context. If you are your average That's the key. healthy yes. American. Now, the guy, uh, uh, Far- Farsi? F- F- Farsi? The issue is we don't have as many average yeah. healthy Americans as well, we used okay. to. That's a, the a, issue. A, a, fair enough. But yeah. if you are, he, he's, a, he's, I think, comparing apples to oranges in that when he drops things down from 3% to 1% in that, in that interview uh, that uh, Aaron put on the montage because he said if you count in all of the people who get it that we're not counting right now he's guessing mm-hmm. but it, it just it, uh, basically they heal themselves which is most people he, he drops it down to one percent but I, he's talking about he's including everybody worldwide to what I believe is an American statistic so if if he was comparing apples to apples that number drops even further if it's in if it's in America because of the health system we have. Um, uh, and uh, yes, you may disagree with uh, how Donald Trump has handled this. I mean, he already had to walk back or correct things in his own speech, which is very, very frustrating. Good grief, gentlemen. Get your act together. But you are you, you are simply, this is not anything close to a death sentence. And the way we are approaching this, psychologically speaking, is utterly fragile. And Great. it is not a way to live your life no matter what you face. Just don't don't be an idiot. Don't be a fool. And, and don't be a sheeple either. Because some people that have wanted what they've wanted for a long time are going to try to use a panic like this to get what they want. Don't let them. Well, good news. Um, your, your dog, 
uh, cannot get coronavirus. So, I mean, there's a silver lining, I guess, in every story. However, that doesn't mean they're getting what they need from the food that we are feeding them. Because just like they do for the human stuff, a lot of uh, the dog's foods are also mass uh, produced for mass consumption to be given a two to three year shelf life. So the prebiotics and probiotics and enzymes and healthy microbacteria and all that, those living organisms that we need to give us the nutrition we require, it's stripped from our food. Same thing is true for our dogs. And that's where Rough Greens VitaSmart comes in. Uh, it's not a dog food. It just makes your dog's food even better by putting all those live cultures into your dog's food that were stripped away. And apparently it tastes great too. Don't take my word for it. I've not sampled it yet. Uh, but our dog, Cap, absolutely wolfs it down. I didn't know a little Bichon can make those kinds of noises at feeding time, but uh, he apparently does when we mix it uh, with his food. He absolutely loves it. So if you want uh, if you want your dog to join our pet, Cap, in taking the Rough Greens 14-day Jumpstart Challenge, you can do so today for just $14.95. Just $14.95 to see your dog thrive. Go to roughgreens.com. That's R-U-F-F. That's how Rough Greens is spelled, R-U-F-F, roughgreens.com slash blaze. That's roughgreens.com slash blaze. Sean Davis is here with us now from the Federalist. Good to have you back, Sean. How are you? I'm great. How are you doing? I'm doing very well, friend. And um, I, I, I thought we would pester you today with questions that I'm struggling with in the wake of what's going on in the country right now that don't make any sense to me. And I know you're a really smart guy, and I don't mean these to be facetious. I I, I am genuinely perplexed at these questions. Do, do you mind being our oracle for the next few minutes, Sean? Let, let's do it. All right. So um, it, it, full disclosure, I'm a huge sports fan. All right. Every year, and I've been doing this, you know, since middle school, my mama always let me take the first two days of the NCAA tournament off from school, provided I didn't have my own basketball game get in the way. If my grades were good, that was one of my rewards. We always take that vacation time. So I'm trying as best I can to set that aside because I'm a husband. I'm a father. You know, I care about my fellow man. I've got more important. I love college basketball. I've got more important things in my life, though. Than, than March Madness. It's a fun escape, but a fun escape is all that it is, okay? I have no problem with canceling all of this. What I have a problem with, though, is why is it I, I seem to be uniquely susceptible to contracting coronavirus or spreading it by attending a college basketball game when about a half a million people have gone through JFK Airport this week alone? That's just one airport, Sean, Okay. That's just one. And it's like the sixth busiest airport in the country. So there's 19,000 plus airports in this country. How, who knows how many millions of people go through them every day. About 45,000 people shop at Columbus Circle Mall in New York City every day. So why, why, why isn't the sports media demanding that that be shut down instead of the, the basketball tournament be shut down. This makes no sense to me. If it's, if, if it's dangerous to go to the game or those are germinating incubators, fine, but then tell me why malls, so, so, so your grandpa with coronavirus can just jump in the jalopy and drive to Idaho if he wants? This stuff doesn't make any sense to me, Sean. Am I asking stupid questions? Can you help me? No, I, I think it doesn't make sense. And I think one reason we've seen is that there's a bit of a game being played by media right now. So look, I don't doubt that uh, this thing is spreading, that it's highly infectious, that uh, people in certain populations, it's really, really serious. But when you see the media go out and scream and bleat and incite a panic in the markets and in homes about a pandemic, and then they come out and say, no, wait, 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 you, you can't stop people from a continent or a country that's being ravaged by this disease from coming in here. That's, that's a little too strong. So what I'm seeing is is a pretty huge mismatch in, in rhetoric, rhetoric from a lot of the uh, the biggest insiders of the panic. And, and to be honest, much of it reminds me of what you see with the uh, with global warming, where you have people saying the world's going to end, we're all going to melt. And yes, by the way, I'm going to hop on my own private jet and fly around on vacation for the next year. And, and I think that's the thing that is really angering a lot of people is this mismatch between rhetoric and action. If this thing is worth shutting down tournaments, shutting down schools, uh, then it certainly justifies shutting down the borders. I totally agree. Like, I'm not opposed to shutting these things down. I'm just trying to figure out why one sector of society, particularly, let, let's, let, 
can we, let's just be brutally honest. All right. Who's more likely to attend the Houston rodeo? Somebody that's going to vote for Joe Biden or somebody that's going to vote for Donald Trump. Right. So I'm, yep. I'm just trying to figure out why one one subsection of the culture has to make extemporaneous, um, you know, uh, not necessary, but fun stuff sacrifices when all kinds of others don't seemingly have to. Like Aaron, my producer who booked, who got you uh, lined up on the show, was sharing with us that uh, he was watching a guy on the NFL Network yesterday lose his mind over, you know, don't be a coronavirus tough guy. Then, then Sean, why the hell did he jump in his car, drive the 405, because the NFL Network's studios are in the heart of LA. Why, why did he jump the, drive the 405, the most populated in, freeway in the United States of America, and go do a television show if he's that concerned about it. This this doesn't make any sense. And it's 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 why I want, I'm trying to draw a distinction with our audience between the disease and the panic. Don't be a fool because you hate the lefty media and go out there and start licking doorknobs and be a moron. OK, be you know, take it, take the virus very seriously. But the, the panics and the shutdowns, the, the, this reminds me of how media corrections always seem to only go one way. Why aren't we screaming shut down all the airports? There's no point to being on a highway unless you're, you're, you're shipping goods and services. Stay in the community 30 days, two weeks, see if we can level off the curve. Why aren't we hearing that then, if, that, if, it's, if, if that's the issue? Why, why can I seemingly only contract this going to the NCAA basketball tournament? Well, again, we get back to the mismatch between rhetoric and action. Now, so let's go back a couple months when we first started realizing what happened. This started in China. In China, that's where it started. I know that you're not allowed to say that because uh, it'll offend a lot of people on CNN and network news. But it started in China, in Wuhan, China, for example, and it started in December. So we started getting wind of it back in January. Uh, the government did. They started making preparations. And when Trump first put together a task force to examine coronavirus and how to respond to it, do you know what CNN did? CNN mocked him and said, you know what, that panel really isn't diverse enough. We need some different colors in there. We're going to need some different uh, biographies and backgrounds. You know, we don't care about the epidemiology or the science. We need more diversity. That's what they were focused on. They were mocking it from the beginning. And then when he shut down travel from China or from foreign nationals who'd been to China, they said, oh, this is this is ridiculous. This isn't going to stop anything. And then after that, when they started realizing that things were getting real, that's when they started inciting the panic. That's when you see the stock market crash. You see these institutions gripped in the panic, start shutting down. So what does Trump do? He gives a White House Oval Office address and says, you know, we shut down travel from China. Now we're doing it from Europe because that's where this thing is really uh, festering and metastasizing. And what do the media do? They freaked out again. They're having a real tough time reconciling their ideology and their demand for open borders and their hatred of Trump with things that you actually have to do uh, that are common sense uh, to help stem the tide of here. And I, I had a friend this morning who's in the, uh, the food retail business who said, you know, people who work for him, their hours are getting cut. They're losing money because of this panic. And the thing he said was people need to wash their hands and turn off the news. And I actually think that's pretty good advice. You know, Sean, that, that brings me to the next thing I want to ask you about. You didn't even know we get a segue there, but it was a perfect segue. The thing that makes me suspicious about this from a from a panic media perspective, and again, I, a good friend of mine called me last night whose dad is elderly and has had some health problems, and he sits home and he watches Fox News all the day, and he thinks everything's a Trump plot, right? We all have parents like this, okay? And 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 he's trying to get his dad to take the virus seriously, and he won't because he thinks the whole thing is a is a plot, to, uh, and, and the virus itself is fake news. Don't be a fool. Don't do that. All right. Don't, don't don't turn your hatred into the people who hate you into your own idol so that you lose common sense. With that being said, however, what what I find fascinating is that I think there could be. Let, let's take it face value that all these sporting events and everything have to be shut down for the public safety. There then, if that's the case at face value, there could be legitimate criticism of the Trump administration for not calling for this to happen nationwide, for not temporarily suspending unnecessary, unrequired travel on America's interstate system, for example, uh, for, for saying, hey, flights are grounded, uh, you know, for 10 days uh, unless they're, you know, necessary travel post 9-11 restrictions. Like to me, that's where they're if, if, if we need to shut down the stuff that we would do when we're not working because that can spread the virus, 
then those are areas where, you know, there could be some legitimate criticism of the White House and this presidency. Yet I don't see that type of criticism occurring in any of these media outlets. Can you make sense of that to me? I I think it's super easy to make sense. It's not a good it's not a fun answer. It's not a uh, uh, an endearing answer. But it's because the media has decided they're going to get Trump. and They're going to get Trump no matter what, which is why instead of legitimate criticism, you know, say about testing or or about shutdowns, they're having a meltdown uh, over borders being closed. And it's a it is a real problem in this country that nobody trusts the media anymore. And I had to my- listen to an hour and a half podcast coasted by the MMA guy from the gross out to who made his name Rogan doing the gross out. What was that show? The gross out eating show. Fear Factor. Fear Factor. Yeah. I had to listen to that guy speak to a, the Trump administration's epidemiologist for an hour and a half to actually get some information on this. I could not get from all of our news channels combined. It, I mean, I, that's pathetic, frankly. It is. What we're called, this is the same institution, uh, the corporate political news media, that spent three years running a Russia hoax. And after that, they started uh, a a nearly year-long impeachment Ukrainian hoax. And then when that didn't work, they decided, you know what, well, let's just whip up a panic, panic, destroy the market, watch the economy crash, and then, you know, just... If a Democrat happens to be elected as a result, fine. And this is why so many people distrust the media and why in a time like this, that is really, really damaging. You need to be able to trust information that you're hearing. And the simple fact of the matter is that people don't because they have been manipulated and lied to for years by the same people who are doing it right now. I want to fast, uh, fast forward if we can. When, we, when, when, when we're past this outbreak, a couple weeks, a couple months from now, or further, the conversation that I think needs to take place is, and, and this has kind of been cast populism uh, versus free trade and nationalism uh, versus uh, uh, globalization. And, and we throw these labels around so we can give each other excuses to not have to actually have a real adult a conversation about something. But when, when I do some research last night and find that our own military relies on the Chinese to provide medical infrastructure for our soldiers, our primary geopolitical strategic rival on the world stage, I mean, that, 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 I, 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 the amount of medical infrastructure we are lacking because we have outsourced this from anywhere from Puerto Rico to China to Taiwan in order to produce this for cheap goods and cheap labor. We need to have a real serious conversation in this country about the amount of sovereignty we have given over for cheap labor and cheap goods. I think that's the conversation that needs to be had because that it, it appears if, 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 if what they're saying is true. People are going to die from this simply because the richest country in the world outsourced its medical infrastructure and we can't we don't have the beds and the and the equipment to take care of them. That's inexcusable, inexcusable, Sean. You're exactly right. And it's not a debate about ideology or nationalism or populism. It's it's actually uh, a discussion we need to have about diversification and fragility. So you're told never put all your eggs in one basket. This is something that we're told growing up that we understand. Don't put all your money in a single stock. Uh, If you're a business, don't make sure that all of your components come from a single supplier. Or if you're in retail or in sales, don't make sure that all of your sales are to one customer because it makes you extremely fragile and extremely uh, sensitive to the whims and fortunes of one other person. And that's what we've done with China. You know, for I'd say 30 years, th- this isn't a problem that popped up yesterday or this decade or just this century. We've been doing it for a long time because we decided and told ourselves, you know what, if we can get a cheap TV and a cheap computer, it's worth outsourcing our entire manufacturing capacity, whether it's for goods we might need to use in a military fight or whether it's our anti- antibiotics. I saw numbers that something like 80 percent of our antibiotics are sourced to China. Yep. It is a huge problem. And this is a decoupling that should have started decades ago, not now. And we are unfortunately uh, uh, reaping the costs of turning our country's manufacturing infrastructure over to the communist Chinese. Sean Davis from The Federalist. Good to see you, brother. Thanks for joining us today here on Blaze TV. Take care. God bless. Thank you, Steve. You bet. Have any thoughts, gentlemen, on that conversation we just had? Well, he's been uh, on fire for a, and largely because of the reasons that uh, some might view as ancillary, but ultimately are primary to this discussion. And it's what you just c- closed with. 
uh, we, this is insane on multiple levels. It, if you are capable of having eyes to see and ears to hear, and that is what's really, whether we talked about what we talked about with uh, how we are handling the specifics of the, the, the virus or how we handle our interaction with China on a regular basis or how our press operates. I, this is all unsustainable. This is why if the American Revolution in many respects has lost. We just turned through multiple ways in which we simply do not have the level of human dignity to stay in it. We do not have the level of street savvy to sustain it. We are utterly broken. We should not be operating as a country as we are right now, but because we still are coasting on the fumes of what I have called the gated community effect, we are capable of getting away with it. But how much longer? Yeah. So, uh, you know, the, the decoupling of our national interests, our national safety, security interests, what have you, um, uh, of uh, of of our national security interests away from away from other countries who do not have our best best interests at heart should be the number one takeaway of what's going on going on right now and in going down and i know the white house i saw this morning the white house has signaled that they are are willing or preparing to to, to make to make some steps at least for some of our infrastructure to get away from china that should be the number one thing yep that should be the number one lesson that we take away from all of this. But the same forces that are driving this panic right now, whether that's spirit of the age or the media, but I repeat myself, the same forces driving that are going to be the same forces that for make us drive us to for, forget Corona. Oh, I love that song in five months after this thing blows over. And so nothing will be learned and nothing will change. And I want to be wrong about that. And I hope that I am. And maybe this is a big enough wake up call. Maybe it's a big enough wake up call to make something like that happen, but I'm certainly, certainly uh, not holding my breath. I want to go back to what I said to Sean about, because this is something I am troubled by, that both of these things cannot be simultaneously true, okay? It cannot be simultaneously true that it is a massive healthcare risk that we have to shut down all of these social settings that people enjoy for their leisure and their fun. But the highways, anybody with any affliction could just jump on a highway, travel an interstate, and spit on and touch every doorknob at every door at every rest stop in America. That uh, any right now, if they wanted to, that I could that that I, I could be inf inf infected with anything I want and just jump on any plane or just even walk through the you know the 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 courtyard of the airport, just rubbing and, and spitting and breathing on as many people and, and banisters as I possibly could. But yet. 4,500 people can't go watch Kent State versus Buffalo play a, college play a college basketball game today. These two things cannot be mutually true. They, they just cannot be. All right? So one of two things is true. This is a gross over... These cancellations are a gross overreaction. Or there's legitimate criticism of this White House that these airports and shopping malls are still open as we speak. And that these 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 interstates have not been shut down to anything that's not that's that's not necessary. The flow of goods and services, first responders, et cetera. But you don't need to go see Nana this weekend right now. Right. It's one of those two. But they but they they they, they can't they can't we, we are asserting two different things right now. And then I'm disturbed that people who want to criticize Trump on everything. This, to me, would seem to be an obvious criticism. Don't you think this is a pretty obvious criticism? Sure. Because these things don't, they're not congruent. They don't make any sense. It doesn't make any sense that you can't go to a film festival in Austin, but you can go to the Austin airport and just walk around all day long infected with coronavirus, breathing it into the air. Does that make any sense to you? None. None. So I, I would like to know what the explanation for that is. Is, is, is the administration not doing enough? Are they not being cautious enough? Are we panicking too much? Because these two things don't make sense at the same time. Which one of them are true? Greetings, and we are back with Hour 2, live and on demand here on Blaze TV, radio, and podcast. I'm Steve Dace, Todd Erzin, and Aaron McIntyre here with me as well. If you are listening to us today via the podcast, if you wouldn't mind leaving us a five-star review wherever you choose to podcast from, because the more of those we get, the more it helps this show to grow, and the more it grows, the more likely we get to continue to do this show, and I think we all want that right now.
So thank you to all of you uh, that have given us those five-star reviews already. If you haven't done so, please consider adding yours to the list as well. 888-900-3393 is the number. 888-900-3393. Steve at stevedace.com is the email address. Like us on Facebook. Follow us on Twitter at Steve Dace Show, youtube.com slash Steve Dace. And we're going to have Aaron put the rundown, the listicle that we opened the show with. I'm going to have you put that up on the Facebook or the uh, YouTube page later today, if you don't mind. So we can share that with as many people as possible. Yeah. All right. Let's get to Theology Thursday, brought to you by Patriot Mobile. You know, we recently witnessed what happens uh, when the media and the Democratic Party, but I repeat myself, collude together. Uh, to get a desired outcome. It's called what happened to Bernie Sanders after he went from inevitable front runner to mortally wounded in about 48 hours when they all worked together to take him out. It's just another reminder that we need to stick together whenever we possibly can. Now, unfortunately, you cannot always choose to do business with people who share your values. But when that option is available and it's the same caliber of product you'd get from somebody who hates you, why not take full advantage of it? And that's where Patriot Mobile comes in. It is the only mobile phone provider that donates a portion of your bill to organizations and causes fighting the good fight, whether it's for the sanctity of life, the right to keep and bear arms, religious liberty, et cetera. They've got plans starting as low as $25 a month, and they come with unlimited talk, text, and the same reliable nationwide service with no hidden fees. If you want to learn more or make the switch, they make it as easy for you as possible to make the switch. Go to patriotmobile.com slash Steve and use the offer code Steve. You'll get a free gift when you open a new line. All right. Offer code Steve. You'll get a free gift when you open a new line at patriotmobile.com slash Steve. That's patriotmobile.com slash Steve. Or you can call them right now at 972-PATRIOT. That's 972-PATRIOT. Well, this is this is providential because when we started this uh, Theology Thursday series, what is this? Uh, this is lesson nine. So this we started it nine weeks ago. And this is based off a Bible study class, a uh, sort of a, an, a freshman entry level seminary uh, class on the New Testament is what my wife and I are taking right now at our church. And part of this class is, you know, everybody has to write uh, a, a paper answering an essay question every week. And I've been sharing the essay questions I've, I've been choosing to answer with the audience for the last nine weeks. When we started this nine weeks ago, we had no idea we were going to be immersed in what we are right now. None. And I literally just during the break, because... That's what we call show prep around here. I, I went and checked what, what Bible um, question we were going to answer for Theology Thursday just during the break. <laughs> last week, as you weren't here, um, uh, Todd, but last week as we were coming back on the air, I was like with Aaron, hey, do you remember which one we did last week? So I know which one to do this week. That's we're guys. That's typically how we roll, right? Okay. I, I, had, I, I could not have planned this if I wanted to. That what we're going to talk about this week. Um, I mean, I, I just looked back, I, I got, I got a chill just even thinking, looking at what we're going to talk about. It, this reminds me of right after I got converted originally, the first, one of the first times I was asked, I don't know if it was the absolute first, but one of the first times after I was being public about starting to be more public about my faith is uh, a collection of uh, men's ministries were hosting an event in rural Iowa and asked me to come and speak. You, do you remember this is story? Is this the pizza money story? Yeah. I love yeah. this story. Okay. And I I, I went to, and spoke there and they they were like, uh, when I agreed to go, they're like, hey, you know, what's your honorarium? And I'm like, I don't know. I host a show in Des Moines. I don't, I, I, should I Google honorarium? How what? high are you willing <laughs> to go? You, you get those? You know, um, I, I told them, hey, you know what I like in small towns sometimes, do you guys have like that local pizza place where everything's made from scratch, you know? And I was I was morbidly obese at this time, so in, heavily in danger of coronavirus. Uh, and so I was like, hey, it, I love the local pizza place. 
when you make everything from scratch right there, the family owned place, you know? And I'm like, if you've got, and they're like, yeah, we got a place out here in Bondurant called Angelo's. I'm like, Hey, yeah. Um, and it's not too small of a town now, but you know, 15 years ago, it was much smaller. And I'm like, Hey, you know what? Have one of those with a, with a, with, you know, an Italian sausage hot, ready to go on my way right out of the oven from the local pizza joint, hand it to me when I walk out and we'll call it even no problem at all. That, that'll be good enough for me. Cause I'm going to miss dinner to speak to you guys. And, um, I go in there and I speak. I couldn't tell you. It was 15 years ago when I said. And um, when I get done, they they have the pizza for me. They hand it to me. And then the guy comes up to me and says, hey, you know, we typically pay an honorarium. So the guys, you know, kind of passed the hat, took up a collection and for an offering. And, you know, we want to compensate you your, uh, your time for coming all the way out here. I was like, no, no, no. I, I'm happy to do it. You don't have to pay me. No, no, no. And, you know, I... I it, I kind of gave off this false humility vibe and I could see after two refusals, I was starting to offend him, you know? And so I went ahead, I looked down, it, it was, it was wadded up into a ball and on the outside was like a 10 or $20 bill. And it didn't look like it was that much money, you know? And, and so I'm like, okay, thank you. I appreciate it. Went home. So I'm driving home one arm on the steering wheel. That was back when I was, uh, uh, I, I think I was do driving the old Dodge Intrepid then. That was a cool car. They don't make those anymore. Uh, and I've got I've got a, a slice of pie in one hand with the sausage with the with the pizza box open, driving down I eighty heading home. And I pull in. We were in our old house at the time, the first home we we earned or, or bought, and it did not have it had a detached garage. All right, so I would park in the garage and I would drive through and I could see what was going on in the kitchen. And Amy is pacing back and forth in the kitchen. As I pull in, I'm thinking, oh no, something is wrong. And early in our marriage, um, if Amy messed up the checkbook or did something terrible with it, I would get really angry. And I walk in, I've got um, this now half eaten pizza. I've, I've, I'm saving the rest in case she wants a couple slices if she hasn't had dinner. And I'm like, hey, honey, what, what's wrong? You know, I mean, um, you're pacing back and forth. And she's like, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm really sorry. I said, sorry for what? She goes, I know I, I messed up the checkbook again. I thought that the check for the light bill had cleared. And this was very early in my career. I was making, I think like 38 grand a year hosting a sports show here in town. And I was the only income. All right, my wife has degrees, and but she wanted to stay home with Anna. And so we were doing a mortgage, single, you know, income home on, on that, okay? And she's like, so this, this, this was, you know, we were, we were down to the penny most pay periods at this point in my career. And she's like, uh, I thought the light bill, the electric bill had cleared. It didn't. And that, the, the check to the electric bill ended up bouncing. And I'm really, really sorry. <clears throat> And I'm like, uh, this is a test. I'm thinking internally, I'm, my, my new faith is getting tested right now. Okay. Do I mean any of the, whatever it was I just said to these guys, do I mean any of this? Okay. <clears throat> and I just took a deep breath um, and said, I'm, 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 I'm not going to let this ang over, anger overcome me over this time. You know, we're all human, we make mistakes. And I'm like, honey, I'm sure it's not a big deal. How much is it? And it was $147 or $74. I remember the numbers were 174. I just remember the exact order they were in. And um, I, I swallowed hard because that was a lot of money to us back then. And I said, hey, you know what? We'll make it work. You know, here, have, have some pizza. You know, inside I'm like, I don't know how we're going to make that work. You know, so I'm pulling out my wallet, my cell phone from my pocket, setting it on the, on the, on the counter. Uh, we're sharing a slice of pie and I pull out this wad of bills and I set it on the counter. And, uh, every time I tell this story, man, it's like, I get, um, uh, uh, moved every time I tell this story. And Amy, Amy looks at the, at the wad of money on the counter. She's like, what is that? I'm like, I don't know. I, I told the guys I, I was fine with the pizza, but these guys were adamant that they had to do a collection. And, um, you know, I didn't even count the money. I don't, I don't know what's in there. So she uh, un, unwraps it and starts counting it. How much money do you think was in that offering? 
exactly the amount of money of the electric bill check that Amy had bounced. The exact amount of money. I mean, we just like, <laughs> um, we just like froze, man. You know, I'm kind of tearing up even thinking about that moment. It's been 15 years, 15 years ago that happened, maybe even 16 years ago. I think that was 2004. And um, when I looked down and I saw what we were going to do for Theology Thursday today, the timing, this this harmonic convergence, I had the almost not quite as potent because it's just not the same when you're when you're new at this and you're first you're taking those first steps out of the boat onto the water, like Peter. You, it, it's just not the same. Doesn't mean it's not special, but it's not. It's just not the same as the first time you took the test, and you didn't pass, but the Lord did. The first time you took the test, and you, and He passed. I had a, but, but it just remind that story. I'm reminded of it when I looked down and saw what we're going to talk about today, because what we're going to talk about today is what I, my favorite part in, of the scriptures. I, I think it is some of the most powerful and moving words that have ever been written, I think, in, in all of human history. And, um, and they're found in, in Romans 8. And Romans 8, 28 in particular. For all things work together for the glory of God and for those called according to his purposes. Now, sometimes this, this verse gets bastardized, like Jeremiah 29, 11. All things work together for good. That, that's not what it says. All things don't work for, together for good. We're in a fallen, sinful, tragic world. But all things work together for God according to his will and for those called according to his purposes. Meaning, he can take the most historically tragic situations. The worst inhumanity, man's inhumanity to man that we do to one another. And in his sovereignty, he can make it work for good. He can... As, as Joseph said to his brothers, what you meant for evil, you did evil. What you did was evil, what you did to me. But God used it for good. And when I think about the timing of this, because we are trying to panic ourselves right now as a people. And I, I know that there's a lot of you in this audience who are trying to abstain from this panic. Unfortunately, you're living and we're all living with one another. So, well, that part's not unfortunate. The unfortunate part is you're not going to be able to insulate yourself from the panic around you. It is going to impact you. And I, I would urge you if you're serious about a biblical worldview to go through the entire book of Romans anyway, because it will challenge you. I, I think it is, I, I think it is the greatest, and you've heard me say this probably on the show before. I think it's the greatest theological work ever written in any religion, in any language, in all of human history. It, it destroys all arguments against the gospel. It answers challenges and, and, and skepticisms that weren't even relevant in the first century, but would come up many centuries later. And I, I think you can, I don't, I don't know if there's such a thing as a biblical, uh, you know, any particular book of the Bible is a litmus test for a church, but you can tell a lot about a, a church's leadership by how they handle this book. Do they teach it as it is? Do they skip over certain sections? Do they ignore it altogether? Because you, can't, you cannot water this down. 
This is solid food from a fire hose, is what Romans is. And yet, in the midst of this, in Romans 8, after he has written some of the most challenging words, and will continue to in the chapters to come, Paul will, will in this book, write some of the most provocative confrontations that Christianity will ever have with this world or in this book. And then some of the most challenging life applications for believers. And what does render under Caesar that which is Caesar? What does that mean? Okay. I mean, he's going he's gonna to confront believers also with some of the most challenging life application for what it truly means to live this out, to, to be a believer. But in the midst of this, of all of these challenges, in, at the end of Romans 8, it's almost like he calls a timeout. And, to, and, and we're going to have a commercial break. I know I've pushed you. It's almost like he's saying, I know I've really pushed you in this book. And, and, and we've got a few chapters to go. This isn't the end of it. I'm going to push you some more. But I, I want to make sure you understand the, the bigger picture here. What my motivation is for this. Why the Holy Spirit is, is compelling me to push you here. And confront you here. And he writes these words. And we know that for those who love God, all things work together for good for those who are called according to his purpose. For those whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son, in order that he might be the firstborn among many brothers. And those whom he predestined, he also called. And those whom he called, he also justified. And those whom he justified, he also glorified. Who is the he? God. He is the one doing all of the work putting in all of the hours, taking upon him all of the stress, all of the pressure. He's doing all of this. Which prompts Paul to then write these words. What then shall we say to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, how will he not also with him graciously give us all things. Who shall bring any charge against God's elect? It is God alone who justifies. Who is to condemn? Christ Jesus is the one who died. More than that, who was raised and who is now at the right hand of God. He is indeed interceding for us. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress, or persecution, or famine, or nakedness, or danger, or sword. As it is written, for your sake, we are being killed all the day long. We are regarded as sheep to be slaughtered. No, in all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am sure that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all of creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. That's just like a... That's like where the minions just drop the mic and walk away. We're done. We're done here. Thank you. Nothing left. Elections are very important. They're not preeminent. This kind of election is preeminent. Turn off the cable news. Turn it off.
stop. Stop obsessing over all of this. Being informed is not obsessing. That's idolatry. Get a workout in. Even if you're just walking around the neighborhood for an hour or 30 minutes. Eat healthy. Load up on the vitamin C. That's a water-soluble vitamin, so you can't overdose on it in any way or do any, any form of um, unintended consequence. Pound it. Like, like I like to pound Cadbury mini, mini eggs, pound the vitamin C. Make sure you are at your max, maximum accepted dosage of vitamin D. Those are the two that are most responsible for boosting your immune system. Eat healthier. Wash your hands. Take a bath. Clean your house. Wipe down your steering wheel and stuff like that that you probably have in all winter long when you and the kids were driving around carrying who knows how many germs because it was flu and cold season. And then make sure to love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, strength, and mind. Love your neighbors as you love yourself. Love your wives as Christ loved the church. Respect your husbands as the one that God has put as the head of the home. Don't exasperate your children. Love on them and discipline them when they go bad. With the goal of bringing them back to being good. Be fruitful, multiply. Go to work. Don't be a sloth. If you have to work from home, then work from home. That's Theology Thursday this week. That's, that's all I got. You have any thoughts? You know, I was, um, I saw on Twitter yesterday a guy in local sports radio who, for the most part, I respect, and you know him, you've worked with him, I'll, I'll leave it at that, but it's the timing of what he's dealing with and the timing of what I've just dealt with personally dovetail, and his his mom has, uh, I believe, cancer recovering from it, and so her immune system is down. And he said, oh, man, I don't care. I, I would cancel every single basketball game there ever was to, to make sure that uh, she was safe. And uh, I got 10 more years with her. Well, I, I understand wanting and have 10 more years with your mom. But compared, like, I, I just watched my dad die. There was a three-day vigil of, of congestive heart failure, uh, uh, on, uh, the, which was he had, and uh, pneumonia kicked in, just like coronavirus would have. If if that was it, two weeks later. I mean, he was not capable of handling it anymore. And uh, you, know, you don't, at the end there, it's on morphine, so they're not feeling it, but you're watching your father drown. I, I, I would, but I wouldn't have ever issued that tweet. And I think it's because of what Steve is talking about. I, I don't, I, I, I in, in watching what I watched, it was never desperate because he, in his final hours, although very wounded the last 18 years because I lost my mom 18 years ago, and it was the book of Job for the last 18 years in many respects, but at the end, I think I said on the show, but he, he went out on a shield, a shield of faith. He said, I'm not going to be afraid of him. He looked me in the eye and said, Hot, I didn't, I didn't know. I think I had the guts to do this. And I said, well, you did, Dad, because, uh, and you know why. Uh, priest came in. It, it was it. There was beauty in defeating that sob that is death. I, I I didn't need to beg and wish cast like 
uh, Steve is talking about regarding a coronavirus. I didn't have to put out a virtue signaling tweet about it. Do whatever you have to do. A sports radio coming in. Good grief. It's endless right now. I, I'm with Steve on this. Be not afraid. It's not just a Hallmark card. You, you, you are not allowed. If you uh, adhere to the faith that we adhere to. To constantly be walking around peeing down your leg about everything. You're not allowed. It's not okay. It just isn't. No matter who you are. No matter what your constitution is. You're not allowed. So stop it. Yeah. That's well said, Todd. And along those lines, I haven't said this on air. I'd, I kind of mentioned it in passing to Todd yesterday before the show. But to, to set that up. Wuhan coronavirus is a result of the fall. Wuhan coronavirus is a result of sin. When you look at things like that theologically, it, it puts things in a little bit better perspective. And none of what I none of what I just none of what I just said um, heightens what we talked about regarding the actual virus and its effects. But when you, but it does, it does put into perspective and it does kind of make sense a little bit more of the panic that we see the ever, ever present panic that we've seen over the last week or so regarding this virus. Because if you were, if you were, I don't know if, if you were going down, um, going down a mine shaft, and it's th a thousand feet in the earth and uh and the elevator and the elevator breaks your salvation to get back up to the surface your elevator breaks and you're stuck down there in the muck and the mire and there's there's some sort of leak or there's some sort of a collapse and your elevator is broken you would feel a great deal of what of panic <laughs> of panic and so it makes total sense here in a very secularized and increasingly so society that we feel stuck because we don't have that sense collectively. There was a time when our country did, I believe, but collectively there's no sense of salvation other than the government or toilet paper or stocking up on things you think you need to survive this. And so there is this panic, and that's why you see the panic is because is because we are faced with something. When we are faced with sin and something that we can't get away from, that actually has talons and it's not just this, not just this uh, ethereal construct or concept, that's when we panic. And that's why you see the panic. Because there is no salvation outside of, outside of the temporal world in an increasingly secularized society. Mm -hmm. So that's why I think you're seeing the panic. And that's something that we haven't really talked on air and probably we should have, but that's something we haven't talked on air as much as we should have uh, probably the last couple of weeks. This is very much a theological you issue bet it is. as anything. You, you bet it is. You're, you're learning right now. You're seeing sheep and goats or sheeple mm -hmm. and sheep maybe separated is a better way of saying it right now. Well said, both of you. When we come back, because of what a lot of what was just said, we're going to stick with our regular schedule and we'll have fun with three non-political questions when we return. So losing your hair sucks, right? Well, you know what doesn't suck? Keeping your hair right there without ever leaving your couch. If you're losing your hair, then you've got to know about Keeps because they offer the generic versions of the only two FDA approved hair loss products. That means they're the real deal. But since they're the generic versions, you're going to save a bundle as well. So here's all you need to do. It's pretty simple. Just answer a few questions online, snap a few pics of your hair, and a doctor will review everything and then recommend the right FDA approved hair loss treatment for you. And then that is shipped discreetly to your door. So you're probably wondering, I mean, is that going to work? Well, a whopping 66% of men experience hair regrowth thanks to Keeps. So yes, losing your hair sucks, but now we can do something about it. All you've got to do is go to keeps.com slash grow. That's keeps.com slash grow and get your first hair loss treatment 
for half off, 50% off your first hair loss treatment at keeps.com slash grow. That's keeps.com slash grow. It is now time for three non-political questions. We all have questions. Who am I? Why am I here? Where am I going? Who am I? A search and a question of identity. Why am I here? A question of meaning and purpose. Where am I going? A question of destiny. Some better than others. What sort of morality or proto-morality would you expect to find in a chimpanzee troop? Injecting some levity into the demise of Western civilization. It's three questions on the Steve Day Show. We need a little a little break from the coronavirus panic. In fact, I, I hope we can get through the next segment. Do you think we can get through the next segment without mentioning that again? I, I sure hope so. Three non-political questions on the Steve Day Show. First question. This one's going to be a doozy. Who's on your Mount Rushmore of female lead singers? That's, wow. That is a doozy. Mount, because there could be several, because we're dudes. So that could be there could be several reasons that she's on there if you know what I'm trying to say, right? It, it may not sure. just be vocal talent. I think you hear me knocking. I do. Anybody coming in here? Okay. I do. Um, I mean, my number one is not. I don't have to even hesitate. I mean, she was my first real celebrity crush. I've told the story before. Oh. Uh, Dream. I think uh, her music box or Dream Box. I remember the name of the album came out the same year or right around the same time as Guns and Roses. Use Your Illusion One and Two, and everybody on campus went to the rec- the CD store at midnight, the campus record store to get that. I went there to get Mariah Carey. All right, so Mariah is number one and- for me, and she's also, by the way, one of she's her voice is kind of toast now, but. Back in the day, I mean, a prodigious, once in a generation kind of singing talent. And just to be clear, because instantly people might be screaming dude code violation. This is one of those times, though, where the dude code, you can steer into something and just own it so hard where you are actually defending the yes. dude code. He can, well, he can I'm in, die I'm on the I'm indignantly cell. contrarian, yes. even if I'm wrong. Yes. My indignant contrarian is the dude code. Respect. Yes. You're willing to hold that position against all other scrutiny. Yeah. We all think it's dumb. All right. But but we will respect your stubbornness and yes. get off my lawn. Right. The yes. dude code that that the dude code can uh can respect that. So she would be on my list. Stevie Nicks, Fleetwood Mac uh would be on my list as well. So there's two. Um I was gonna go with Stevie Nicks as well, because uh, uh Go Your Own Way is one of yep. my favorite all time songs. It's I think it's I think it's a, like, it would probably be in like my top twenty yeah. all time favorite uh rock songs. Um this now I may push you on this one, but I I think uh Rhythm Nation eighteen fourteen was one of the best albums of the nineteen nineties. I mean there's like seven or eight tremendous songs on that album. So, so I'm gonna put Black Cat and all uh, yeah, that yep, stuff, yeah. Um and uh, wish you were here and all those songs. So I'm going to put, I'm going to put Janet Jackson on that list. All right. So I've got Janet Jackson. I've got Mariah Carey cause Janet Jackson's first album control was really good too. Um, so I'm going to put Janet Jackson. I'm going to put Mariah Carey and I'm going to put Stevie Nicks on that list, which leads me. And this is always what happens with me on these Mount Rushmore yeah, questions, right? Last first one. three, I'm like, I just bleh, blurt them out. We get to the last one. And then I'm like hesitating. Cause I got 10 people or 10 things and I'm, and I've only got one slot left. So I'm going to let you go while I consider who my final one is. Well, they're top of mind right now and it, it makes it easier. Uh, and it happened, it, Steve, you did your little pizza coincidence uh, yeah. the thing here, no little thing, but when I was driving, uh, back to my hometown of, uh, Madison, Wisconsin, and I think it was, it all blurs. I think it was the first time when my father was in the hospital, not when I was driving back for the funeral. And, uh, I was just looking for some music and so many of the songs, you never know, were speaking to me, uh, in very specific ways in two ways is two of the artists and the songs that came on both were women who have died within the last year and the particular songs that they sang uh, sp- spoke to me as well but the fact that they had passed uh and i don't remember their names but uh one was the lead singer of rock set she yeah the blonde i the can't blonde, remember her name but, but yep, yep and the other one was the lead singer of the cranberries who also oh, d- uh, Dolores Riordan? Yeah. She, I think was, she also yeah. died within the last year. So I, that she was, was a big time pro life activist. Actually, did you know that? 
I don't think I did. Yeah, she was a she was a pro life activist. But. So those are top of uh, mind, but um, they, they, I, they were kind of an island in the storm on a drive where you can you're four and a half hours and you're just you know pondering what you're coming back to. So the, there's those three, and uh, one I heard recent. Um, I mean, old school. You know, they still pull out. I'm surprised at how much you still hear her. Uh, you know, Pat Benatar was just cool. Yeah, you know, Aaron's gonna drop. Um, Oh, I just saw the name. I was too. thinking about Pat Benatar. You know, you know, he's going to drop York, right? Music, oh, artist, no. music. Yeah. Okay, I have my fourth. Yeah. I'm going way old school for this one. Way old school. What's one of my all-time favorite movies? Wizard of Oz. And I yeah. love Meet Me in St. Louis as well. Yeah. I think she had a uniquely terrific voice. So I'm going to, uh, I'm going to put Judy Garland as the fourth on my list. So I'm, I've that is an eclectic collection. Okay. Yeah, um, your college uh, celebrity crush hottie. Um, uh, then you have, uh, you know, Janet Jackson with a, a quintessential pop R&B album. Then you have the the sultry, smoky, uh, classic rock singer and Judy Garland. That that That's an eclectic collection. I'm going to go with those four. Uh, I'm going with Debbie Harry, Blondie. Uh, that I, didn't, I did not see that one coming from hey, you. Well... Three out of these four, you're probably not going to be seeing. Okay. Coming from. Um, Haley Williams from Param Paramore. That's a little bit after you guys is yeah, you know prime. We're not cool anymore. Yeah, um, when you get into that stuff. You're yes, right. Stevie Nicks because I like I like Fleetwood Mac just as much as the next guy and uh, Gwen Stefani. So that that's my. I could see Gwen my, Stefani. That's my see that. yeah, yeah. That's my Mount Rushmore. Of is uh, she a home wrecker now? Didn't she uh, get break up Blake Shelton's marriage or something? Or did I, I, don't I don't think I don't she know. broke it up. I think she just stepped in. Well, well, well he broke up his marriage yes. for her, right? I only know because my my the girls love The Voice, love that show. They've watched it for years, so um, I hear them talk about it. Yeah. Uh, question number two: If you could eat steak for the rest for every meal for the rest of your life, but you had to give up anything sugary. Would you take that deal? If not, what would it take for you to give up everything sugary? No way I could do it. No, I've just, I've got too much of a sweet tooth. I could not do it. So then what would it take for you to give up something su sugary? Wait, this Wait, was Something or everything sugary? Everything. Yeah. And that would guarantee I get to eat steak the rest of my life? Yeah. Oh, that's a piece of cake. Yeah, yeah, I couldn't do it. Oh my goodness. There's, there's no way, no how I could do it. No way. Know thyself, so I appreciate yeah. that as well. I, oh, I, I could do it easy. Without hesitation, I couldn't do it. So what other food would I give up for sugary stuff or anything? What would you get what would it take for you to give up sugary food? Uh death. Okay. Yeah, I mean I just giving up life. Yeah, I mean I mean that I mean it's 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 one of the joys I have in life. I've got a sweet tooth. I like sweets, you know, it's why I uh punish myself at the gym. So I don't weigh 300 pounds again and can justify doing that. I mean, it's just, we all have our, th our things, right? You love your vinegar. You I know do. what I'm saying? And right now it's yeah. more important than ever. <laughs> well, <there's> Apple <laughs> cider vinegar. You might be onto folks. something now. Get on it. Y'all went out and bought toilet paper, which you should have done. Where'd it go bought that? the apple cider vinegar. Okay. Where the vinegar at? I want the vinegar. All right. Uh, but I, it's just, I mean, that that's. It would it would have to be something that like I'd give everything up for my my family, you know, something like that, and that, which is an obvious question. But I mean, I just sweets are one of the things for me that make living east of Eden worthwhile. I love sweets. No, I get it, but it would be easy for me to give up. Yeah, I'm with Todd. I'd 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 give up. Uh, sugar There's just too many other meats. I'm like, you know, steak is great. I love it. I like myself some grilled salmon, some grilled chicken. Plenty of things I'm I can not, and, and, and keep no. keep the Cadbury mini eggs and Reese's peanut butter cups no. coming. We're going to have to smoke some salmon at the uh, McIntyre ha household soon. Uh, let's see. What's the closest you've ever come to legitimately dying? A really, really upbeat way to end this. Oh, wow. Really? You should have had this the first question, Aaron. Goodness, we're going to end on, <laughs> end on this note. Uh, I'm like, I got to think of that. Legitimately dying. Right now, this moment, coronavirus, clearly. <laughs> Walk off. No, uh, here's one. I, I was uh, out in, when I lived in Utah, so I'm in my early 20s, and we uh, went to the, uh, what's it, Uinta Sand Dunes, I think they're called, southern Utah, and uh, doing uh, four-wheeling. And these, it, it, 
you know, you feel like you're in Dagobah out there. Uh, a ton of fun. But I was with two buddies that were, I, I had never been on a four-wheeler before. And, and uh, they were more experienced than me. So you, you it's it's kind of like learning, you, you skiing, and then you when you, you ski jump, you get some air, you know, and you kind of got to crawl before you can walk. So not really having a great sense of uh how to uh how much gas you need you know i would just I, it was kind of failure after failure just you basically just kind of roll over the hill well the next time i w- went too far and i like i launched myself and came down uh front tires first my thighs slammed into the handlebars i got ejected and i hit the sand and i'm young enough and spry enough and i'm and i'm thinking as i'm rolling there is a very very large machine coming down after me so i'm kind of trying to look at where it is and it 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 cleared me it didn't roll on top of me but not only is it heavy but you have a very hot muffler that can burn you so i ended up walking away with quite a limp but it could have been a heck of a lot worse um wow I've, I'm, there was a time, I don't remember it. My mom tells me a story about a time when I was little that Dave tried to uh, teach me how to swim and threw me into a river, you know, the old school way. And not even a pool, yeah, and, a river. And figured survival, survival instinct would, would work. And, and I was too young and didn't. So they, he had then had to jump in and save me, I guess. Um, you know what? I do remember one now. Now I will tell you it was about it wasn't it was about this time last year it was it was a month from now late April last year I thought I was dying right in here Oh yeah when you know when I was having those heart oh, palpitations yeah. and th- and one of the reasons I came in and did the show I'm not kidding you I I, I was thinking if, if I'm having a heart attack I'm going out with my boots on man I'm just going to come in have my say I don't even remember what the topic was that day or what we said okay I just remember thinking I'm, I'm dying here, but you know what? I'm going out. I'm going out with my boots on. I'm tapping out. I was convinced I was having a heart attack as I was sitting here taping that overtime that day. And then it, I thought it was like, I was making like some brash last stand and reality um, turned was, out it was too much I, Coke zero yeah, and too much caffeine. I think Todd and I mentioned or asked each other, is something, something up with him today? The real, that's true story. I, I was sitting here thinking, you know what? Going out like a chant. Nope. I'm just a chump who needs to stop well. mainlining Coke Zero. <laughs> but the real one is, um, do you guys, did they have these when, when uh, I just did the Seinfeld show? It, it is the side of my nose. Todd can verify. Side of my nose, right? There's a whole Seinfeld episode about yes. whether you got caught picking your nose or not. <laughs> um, what did they call them? Uh, fireballs? Atom balls? Do you remember those? Those giant big red jawbreakers okay. that you would suck on. Yeah. Do you remember those? Sure. Did you have those when you were a kid? Oh, Aaron? yeah. yeah. And uh, Dave and Vicky were getting ready to go out. I, I I remember this. I was about 10, 11 years old. Dave and Vicky were getting ready to go out. That's my, That was my mom and my stepdad. We're getting ready to go out. And uh, if, when, if Dave was getting ready, Dave and Vicky were getting ready to go out, that means Dave had the music blare and usually like, you know, Elton John, Best of the Doors, journey okay and so he's blaring some music where they're getting ready to go out waiting for nana to come and babysit me and scott my little brother and uh i'm taking one of these fireballs atom balls i'm taking one of them to town and the music's blaring in our house and um all of a sudden i accidentally swallow it and start choking on it and i'm looking around and i can't breathe this is it And I'm panicked. No one can hear me because the music is blaring. Dave just so happens to come out of the bathroom and sees me choking. And we we didn't know the Heimlich in 1982, 83. We didn't teach parents that. So what do you think Dave did? Smacked you? Absolutely, man. He, he, and and just, just, dude, just, yeah, you know, uh, it was Palm Sunday into the back of into the back of my shoulder blades, and I launched that thing out of my mouth. Literally, it saved my life. That's probably the uh, I was probably ten or eleven years old. We were living in Orlando, Florida at the time, and uh, that was probably the closest I've ever come to dying. Now, have you guys ever saved anybody before? I have done that. My first year at uh, Michigan State, we were having London broil for dinner, 
And we were a bunch of the people from our uh, dorm floor were sitting together. We had just watched the debut episode of Beavis and Butthead and they're playing frog baseball. Beavis and Butthead were playing baseball with frogs and we just thought it was the funniest thing and we all start laughing about it. And this, uh, this guy uh, that lived down the hall, he's sitting next to me named Steve. He starts choking on his London broil and gagging and his face starts turning and everybody's like, and the whole cafeteria at Wonders Hall is freaked out. You know, everybody starts turning around. Nobody knows what to do. And I was, I did I, instinct just took over. I was sitting next to him. I didn't even know that I like knew the Heimlich maneuver. I, I jumped up. He's a little guy now. And yeah, I, I wasn't morbidly obese yet, but I was, I played sports and stuff. I was a pretty, I was, I was a bigger guy. He's a little dude. So, I mean, I, I did, the, I, I tried to figure out, try to remember what the Heimlich was and put it around his torso. And cause I also remember you, I've read somewhere once that you could break people's sternums oh, yeah. doing it. Yep. So I'm like, I don't want to really hurt this guy, you know, but I want to get it out of there. And so I like lifted him out of his, out of his lunch chair and, and hit him really hard like that. And the London, the first time, that's all I knew what to do. And the London piece of London broil went, plopped on the floor and then like the rest of the dorm cafeterias when they saw he was safe just went back to what everybody else was doing like nothing happened right <laughs> nice. so that's that's maybe my one heroic moment ever nice yeah i really needed to throw that in after um going to the er for overdosing on caffeine <laughs> but i have not i have not had any caffeine since april 23rd of last year that's the last i've not had any i drank any pop with any caffeine haven't had any since April 23rd. It's probably a good thing. That's probably a good thing. Uh, None of the tea caffeine. that I like, because you guys know I yeah. like tea. But, and, and what's shocking is it's not, I didn't have any withdrawal at all. None. I mean, because I was pounding the peach mango green tea too, man, with the Coke Zero. And I mean, I was, I mean, I was drinking that stuff every bit as much as water. So I never had any, um, any withdrawal and I really haven't missed it all that much. You know, I found a, I, you know, Walmart has caffeine, or Walmart here locally has caffeine free Dr. Pepper, you know, and I have one of those every couple of days or a few days just to kind of, you know, give me a little taste of the, of the good life and I'm good to go. We live in a blessed world and, and, until coronavirus. Now it, I'm going to, yeah. you know, which makes me thinking, makes me think maybe y'all are getting your hand sanitizer and, and toilet paper. I might run over to Walmart and just get all the, the cherry vanilla Coke zero. Figure we're all on our last legs anyway. Might as well go ahead and get my last, you know, uh, last uh, binge of my favorite drink out of the way here on the way out as a tap out. What do you think? We should, well, just, until those supply chains are in our, we should do our Mount Rushmore of things we would hoard. <laughs> oh, <laughs> that, yeah. That's, that's a, good, a good question. Yes. yes. That's, you know, what's funny is Noah was not taking this seriously at all. I mean, well, he was, but he's, he's a teenage boy. He wasn't worried about it. He was taking it seriously. But when I, we, we, when, he, when I asked him to explain a, when he asked me to explain what the supply chain was, as we were watching Beck last night, and I said, well, you know, we're looking forward to that PlayStation 5 coming out later this year. And that's all made over there in Asia. All the parts are made over there. Yeah. It could delay the release of that. If you could have seen the abject look of terror in that 13 year old boy's eyes, that, that brought this home. <laughs> First World Problems yes. by Noah Days. All right, that's going to do it. We're going to stick around and do some overtime for our Blaze TV subscribers at blazetv.com slash Dace. Hope you're a subscriber too. For the rest of you, we are back at it again tomorrow, noon to 2 Eastern, right after Glenn Beck. Until then, John 317.